We're here today to present um, mainly about our uh, community schools partnership, and that's been kind of the theme of the day. So I'm going to take a few minutes so we can all introduce ourselves. So Lara, do you want to introduce yourself? Can you? We can barely hear so Good afternoon. They can barely hear me. Good afternoon, I'm Laura Chalakian. I am a licensed clinical social worker and the manager of uh, Thrive School Mental Health at the Pasadena Unified School District. Great, and my name is Shefali Desa. I'm the Assistant Vice President of School-Based Mental Health and Early Education at Sycamores. John, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, sure yes. Uh, good afternoon, Sacramento. Uh, my name is John Lynch, and I'm the community school specialist at the LA County Office of Education, uh, working on the community school model here in Pasadena Unified. It's great to be here today. Thanks, John. And then Marisa? I'm Marisa Perez-Martin. I'm the Vice President of School-Based Mental Health and Early Education Services at Sycamores. And Shannon? I'm Shannon San Pedro. I'm the Clinical Director of School-Based Services at Sycamores. Awesome. So that's our panel for today. And like, you know, through the pandemic, it's hybrid, fun, th fun times. All right, so Shannon, can you tell us a little bit about Sycamores? Yes, so we are a community-based mental health and child welfare organization serving roughly 6,858 youth and families a year in Los Angeles County. We have a wide array of services including outpatient, community-based, school-based, which is my favorite, um, residential, wraparound, prevention and early intervention, PEI, full service partnership, and therapeutic behavioral services. Thank you. Great, thank you. Awesome, thanks Shannon. Laura, can you tell us a little bit about Pasadena Unified School District? Absolutely. So PUSD's Student Wellness and Support Services Division, we house two unique internal mental health agencies that are uh, dedicated to providing mental health services to our student community. And the two agencies are PUSD Mental Health Services and my department, Derived School Mental Health. Our aim is to provide a spectrum of comprehensive, integrated, culturally sensitive services that support the academic achievements of all of our PUSD students by addressing the mental, social, and emotional barriers. So my department, we develop and oversee what's called our district mental health integration teams. They're, they're basically multidisciplinary mental health care teams focused on collaborating between multiple systems in the school and the community. Uh, I'll give a quick, quick background on these, these, these teams, I think we'll, we'll dive deeper into it later, but they just collaborate with the home team. They help reduce barriers between the school and mental health agencies. Uh, these teams discuss behavioral concerns per student that are impacting their academic performance and their overall well-being. They identify barriers, they reduce barriers to different types of services. So it's really a holistic um, perspective and the team just tackles all the mental health and academic issues just to make sure the, the students are thriving. And so LACO, which is LA County Office of Education, Sycamores, and Pasadena High School here at PUSD, they've established a very well-flowing and exemplary mental health integration team as part of the community schools model. Cool, thanks, Lara. John, can you tell us about your role and the LA County Office of Education Community Schools? Sure, thank you. Uh, so the community school model at the LA County Office of Education, or we call it just LACO for short, uh, launched in September 2019, um, we're in 15 high schools and 15 districts across the country. And high school is really like the venue So we I think LACO really believes that high schools um, in a lot of our cities are kind of major cultural institutions, right? Major, major kind of like historical institutions in a lot of our cities uh, and opportunities for us to really use the school as the hub. Right, and so I'm really excited. I live in Altadena, which is next to, you know, kind of right next to Pasadena. My kids go to Pasadena High School. I'm Pasadena Unified, and so I'm really excited to be doing the work, this community school's work uh, in the district where I live and where, I, and where my kids go. Um, and then the idea of a community school, I'm sure many of you are aware, right? It's just really creating the hub 
uh, at the at the school site because you know young people are at our schools you know oftentimes more than they're with their parents right and so how do we use those as opportunities um, to build relational trust and to connect families to wraparound services and those holistic services that as this conference says breaks barriers right and reduces barriers for young people to be their best selves and their parents to be as least stressed as possible and more likely to be supportive and connected uh, to their to the young person. So the, the way that we're staffed also, there's two of us on each campus. So there's a, a specialist like myself um, who really coordinates services and brings agencies in. And I work closely with an educational community worker who does a lot of the parent engagement work. So we're a, a dynamic duo uh, making it happen uh, here in, in Pasadena High School. So I'm excited to talk about some of the work we've done, uh, specifically some of the mental health work we've done with, with Sycamore. So I'm excited to be here, thanks. Great, thank you, John. So a little bit about the mental health integration team process. So basically what happens in that process, and John, Laura, Shannon, feel free to chime in if you want to. Um, but basically what happens on a fairly monthly basis is the team gets together. Um, so Sycamores, PUSD, LA County of Office of, uh, Office of Education, so typically John, the mental health integration team meets and in that team, they also bring in other providers that are part of the community schools model. So there may be um, like Young and Healthy, which is one of the partners that we collaborate with. They bring um, help children get linked to Medi-Cal. They bring dental services, um, mobile crisis units, things like that. And then in addition to that, we also have school personnel that are coming to those meetings as well. So it's an opportunity for everyone to sit at the table once a month and talk about the students, students that have needs, um, things that need to be worked out in the system. So we, we basically talk about, um, and Shannon goes to those meetings and talks about the clients that we're working with, the individual family therapy, rehab services, case management services, needs that the family or client may have, um, and any adjunct services that we can offer to support. And then PUSD, um, they bring in their administration, school counselors, nurses, school psychologists, mental health providers, school social workers, anyone that is going to add something to support the students and the families that we're all working with. And then LACO, as I said, so John t is the one who typically attends and leads those meetings um, and can talk about you know, what, how are things going in, in, within the community schools models at, P, at Pasadena High School and what are the things that we can bring in or what are the improvements we need to make or are there other partners that we need to partner with and extend, um, you know, partnership with so that we can really, again, work on that whole child approach that community schools is intended to, um, to serve. Do you guys have anything that you wanna add? Very concise. Um, we call them the hit meetings, and uh, they're so great in regard to being able to identify any any problems mm -hmm. that we have. And it's been great um, having John run them. I think because they've been more stable and organized, and we stay on track, which can be hard sometimes. John, do you want to add anything? I mean, I don't, I don't think so at this time. I think we'll, we'll get into it a little bit deeper uh, later, but, but it's, um, I think there's, there's it's, I guess I'll say one thing. I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a lot of benefits to the work that we've done. Um, the first benefit is for young people, right? I think by having uh, closer eyes on them and talking about young people holistically, we, we support them more deeply and more consistently than we have in the past, number one, right? I think the second piece is that actually by bringing adults together, it's good for adults, right? So um, by bringing adults, adults who work in the school and work in the system together, um, it helps to build relational trust amongst adults. Um, we can we, we demystify questions around like, well, are my kids getting served or they're not getting served? Or um, what, what happened to that student? And, and, and I think it, it just demystifies the questions that you might have if they don't get asked. So how do we put, how do we put adults in the room together on a consistent basis? Um, the same way we do with teachers with professional development, right? So uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a great opportunity and, and there's a lot, of, um, a lot of positive outcomes and we'll talk about those as the time um, goes on. Great, thanks, John. So we centered our uh, presentation and panel today around the Maxwell family. So we've got 
the slide up just so you all can read it and take a minute just to kind of refresh about the Maxwell family. Um, I'll kind of highlight some bullet points. So the household consists of 40-year-old black Hispanic father, 70-year-old mother, and the three children aged four, nine, and 17. The mother is estranged from the family. They're currently renting a house in the Central Valley of California, uh, behind on rent, worried about eviction. The family has both friends and family to support them. Most are similar, uh, but most are in similar straits. Um, Carlos is 40 years old, cisgender, hetero, man of black and Hispanic heritage. Graduated from high school, works in the restaurant industry, uh, currently has credit card debt, is generally healthy, th though stressed due to his employment and family situation. Jordan, who we in particular are going to focus on today as part of our panel, is 17-year-old cisgender lesbian female of black and Hispanic heritage. Um, spent the ages of four to six in foster care while her dad was getting off drugs. She suffered some physical abuse at a young age. She is currently in high school and back in person. Works part-time to have a little extra money as well to help with the family expenses. Tries to balance school, work, financial responsibility, and caretaker responsibility since she acts as a parent to her younger siblings when her dad is working. And she has anxiety and burnout, but does not feel comfortable discussing it with her parents because she feels they have negative attitudes about mental health and does not have anyone else in her life she feels comfortable discussing her struggles with. So this is pretty typical, um, particularly with the high school populations that we work with at the different schools that we are at. So Eric is one of the younger siblings, nine years old, black, Hispanic, and white male who is questioning gender identity, um, attending in-person school and excited to be with his friends, has dyslexia, ADHD, and an undiagnosed depression and anxiety, was exposed to drugs in utero as well. And then Vanessa, who's four, she attends state preschool two days a week, has no expressive language, but receptive language is age appropriate, and shows no other general or mental health um, lacks except those due to her family's living in financial situation. And she has been identified as being on the autism spectrum. She is triggered by music, loud noises, and movement activities without advance warning. And the mother has been estranged from the family since Vanessa was one. And then we have Allison Kaplan, who is the mother of Eric and Vanessa. She's 33, cisgender, hetero, white woman. She finished high school with a GED and took some classes to help her employment situation. Um, she is estranged from her children's father and does not live with them. She is generally healthy but also generally stressed. And she is not involved with the children's day-to-day -day lives and visits irregularly, but Carlos is trying to get her more involved. So that's the Maxwell family as a whole, and we will be focusing on Jordan, who is 17 years old. All right, so we are going to ask some questions of the panel now. So John, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you for this question. Can you talk a little bit about how your work is connected to community schools and um, other existing state integrated care efforts? All right, they know it's to me. <laughs> a little hard to hear on my end, but it's all, it's all good. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're firmly rooted in, in, in the community school model, right? Um, I pre previously, before my life before uh, coming to Pasadena Unified in Laco, uh, I was a school leader, uh, and I and I worked in community school. I've been working in different community schools since 2007 uh, in LA Unified and also in Oakland Unified. Um, so I'm a firm believer in the power of collective action. I think that schools 100% cannot do this work by themselves. That we need to be working with everyone who cares about kids and has resources and supports for young people and their families, right? Um, and so this work, and this, this work is very much rooted in the community school model. Um, mental health was an express need of our school community before the pandemic, right? So before the pandemic, when I arrived, I think I was here six months before the pandemic started, um, it was very clear that we had a mental health um, issues to deal with on campus, right? And I think our administration was very clear on that, and Sycamore was very clear on that. Um, I think the pandemic made our parents much more clear on the mental health needs uh, of both themselves, I'm a parent too, uh, and, and, and their students, right? And so the pandemic has really reinforced 
and double down our efforts on supporting the mental health needs of, of our students in the holistic work that we do as a community school. Um, and I'm excited to partner with Sycamores, man. I mean, they've been, they've been in the game at our site for like 25 years, right? And that's, that means a lot, right? That, that means like they're not a fly by night. Um, when, 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 it was, when it was not that sexy to be on a school campus, they were still here. Right, and so um, we're excited. I'm excited to work with them uh, because I think I know that they're, they're ready to say the course, and I think they'll be around for for 25 more. Um, so, so yeah, our work with them is very much rooted in, in the community school model, and um, yeah, that, there it is. John, can you add a little bit about some of the other partners that are on campus? Some of the other partners that are uh, on campus for the community school model. Yeah, uh, sure. So in terms of mental health specifically, and, and please nudge me if you want to hear more about other stuff, um, mental health specifically, we have three main partners, Pasadena uh, Mental Health, which, which is kind of under, uh, under Lara, um, Sycamores, which is our only site-based mental health partner. So like I can walk uh, two minutes across the, across the way and walk into their office, uh, and also Foothill Family. And so it's really kind of cool to have three different uh, entities on campus. Um, but, but and, and, and one of them I brought, one of them I brought, I kind of brought Foothill family a little bit deeper in, but I, but I didn't bring them in at first, right? I was, that wasn't my first thing to do. Like, oh my God, like, let me, let me scramble and get more partners, right? I think, I think first I, um, I took a needs assessment. I had to get an understanding of what, what, we, what we had and what we, what we needed, right? And I think with Sycamores, we have a, a very invested partner, but Sycamores also works mostly with students who have Medi-Cal. So, so, you know, we, we have a population on our campus of kids who live in million dollar homes and we have a population of kids who are tripled up into one bedroom, right? And so we have a range and, you know, as a community school, we're supporting million dollar homes and we're supporting tripled up in, in, in a one bedroom too, right? And so, um, so we brought Foothill family in because we knew that we need, they had some additional funding that would allow us to be a little more flexible, right? And so they felt, they filled a need that we didn't necessarily have. So we're, we're you know, thinking about, um, college and career readiness, how do we maximize those partners, thinking about um, student engagement support, how do we maximize those partnerships, and also thinking about parent engagement support, how to maximize those partnerships. Those are kind of the four main buckets of work at our community school. Thank you. How are you connecting those efforts for maximum impact and service of this particular youth and family? So meaning um, Jordan and her family, and I'm gonna toss this over to John and Shannon, actually. I'll go ahead and I'll start. Um, I think kind of piggybacking off of what you said, John, we, we have been at Pasadena High School for over 20 years, providing school-based mental health services, which means we are there 40 hours a week providing this service. And it, it was a very strong relationship, but having John come in and facilitating these amazing meetings with all of us. I think more needs were met, more people were coming to the table with better ideas, um, and it was just really great to have that. And so since that time, if, if we were looking at this to maximize um, the need for Jordan, we would, we would probably hear about Jordan in a Mahit meeting. We, a, a, her counselor might bring her up, um, you know, maybe even John would bring her up if, if there was some, you know, if she came by and maybe was asking for something, just there, there's eyes on all the kids. And so I think having him there and then even um, the counselor, we would be able to just identify this person and start putting things in place to try to get some services. And I think um, for my positionality as a community school staff member, it really, Again, I'm, I'm site-based, so I'm here, you know, I'm here, I'm kind of like another administrator on campus in many ways, right? And, and I really, I have one foot in the school and one foot in the community, right? So if I have a kid like Jordan, Jordan's, Jordan's struggling with her grades, I might meet with Jordan and say, hey, what's going on? Like, talk to me about biology class. And then but Jordan might say, yeah, you know, biology is tough because the teacher goes really fast and I don't really, I don't really, I don't really catch up. And so we might talk about tutoring, or we might talk about like advocacy, like maybe you should just email your teacher, right? But, but I... But I can do that because I actually know who that biology teacher is, right? And so I can do, we can, we can make some of those moves together around teacher engagement or, or advocacy with your counselor or getting tutoring services because I do have one foot 
in the in the school site, right? And I'm not going to tutor her, but I'll connect her to tutor, right? I'm not going to maybe email her teacher for her, maybe I will, um, but I but but I'll but I'll direct her and nudge her to do that, right? Um, but I also have one foot outside the community, right? Uh, into the in, outside, outside the community, outside the school, in the community, um, and you know, in this case with the Maxwells, it's it's complicated, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in this family that needs to be addressed. And there's some roots, right? There's a root around economic struggle and stress, right? There's a root around kind of early abuse and, and foster care, foster care systems, right? Um, there's, some, there's some stuff around, around work opportunities, both for the, the father and for the young person. Uh, and these are, these are places where there's resources, right? Um, you know, we're in California. We're like, it's like the sixth biggest economy in the world, right? we have resources for, for, for young people and their families. And I guess the question is like, how do we, how hard are we willing to work and how aggressive can we get to get young people and their families like the Maxwell and jo the Maxwell's and Jordan, uh, the types of, of resources that they deserve. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to work pretty aggressively to do that. Great, thank you. Shannon, you mentioned it already a little bit just around that, what that referral process would look like for Jordan at Pasadena High School. Can you talk a little bit about that and how all the other referrals can also come for the other family members and mm -hmm. what that process looks like. How do you follow that up? Yeah, so this is something, especially in the Maxwell family, where Jordan is a little bit worried about the family's ideas about mental health and things like that. And I think us just being on campus is kind of nice because people see our faces, even parents see our faces. But what's more important, I think, is that they will know John, most likely. And so if John is, you know, calls the family and says, there's, here's all these resources. Also, we were thinking about referring Jordan to um, some mental health therapy that we have on campus. Would you be okay with that? We're more likely to get the okay. Because if they trust and trust John, and then John trusts us, we're more likely to get that to happen. So because the school knows us, actually, anybody, a kid can walk into our office and they could refer themselves. Um, a, a teacher can refer them. Um, the teachers all know us. We go to teacher meetings to just introduce ourselves, to kind of talk about things. Um, a nurse can refer them. Uh, the principal, John, literally anybody <laughs> can just refer. And we have referrals. John has done an excellent job of making, getting our referral on to the PHS website which has been so helpful, especially during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and then we just have them in our, we have a box at the school. We also try to, uh, pre-pandemic, we would provide all the teachers with like a folder of like, if this is what you see, this might be a good candidate for mental health services. And it included our referral as well. Great, thank you. What is the process for developing SMART goals for Jordan and how are they monitored within a community schools model? So this is John and Shannon, whoever wants to go first. John, I'll start, is that okay? So I think, so say, so say Jordan was referred and we would, we would assign Jordan a therapist that would do a 30 day assessment essentially just identifying all of the things, a very well rounded assessment which would include input from Jordan, input from Jordan's dad, John, the counselors, teachers, any anyone that they identify as important. And um, we would then create what our mental health smart goals, like what we think and what Jordan wants to specifically work on. And I think how we would monitor it is in these Mahit meetings, we would have that happen monthly. We might just kind of go over Jordan's treatment and what we've been thinking about and what we've been doing. And then, you know, John, because we kind of disperse what's needed. Like John's really good at like identifying community resources. You know, we got the therapy piece down. Mm -hmm. The counselor could, you know, give a little bit more time to Jordan and maybe identify like, okay, these are some goals that I want you to do for your bio class. Like, and so we kind of all would come together and see how, how are they doing? And sometimes when we don't have meetings like this, when we don't have this type of collaboration, because it sometimes happens at some of our other schools if we don't have something like this, we think that the kid's doing great. 
like they're meeting their therape therapeutic goals. We're hearing from the parent, everything's AJ squared away, but they're failing all of their classes. <laughs> and so there's still some work that could be done. And even though our model, we do, we do therapy and we also have um, rehabilitation, um, I, I think that we could definitely still work with them. And we wouldn't know that unless we were in this meeting <laughs> and having these pretty consistent discussions about them. And so John's very helpful in that way. Yeah, I think, I think these mental health integration team meetings, they happen monthly. All the counselors are there. Hathaway Stickermore staff is there. Now we have Foothill family staff there. Now we have PUSD mental health staff there. Um, admin, myself, and we have a tracker. And we just kind of, we were able to talk through students. Um, and, and, and a counselor may be like, hey, you know what? I'm really concerned about such and such. Like, tell me about what's going, you know, not, not tell me the specifics about like what they're, what they're dealing with, but are you seeing them? Like, how's it going? Yeah, they're super engaged. They're like meeting their goals. And, and, and I think, you know, it, we don't always see those things show up academically. Um, or we may see things show up academically and a kid may be kind of dis, you know, divesting in, in the counseling services, right? And so then how does a counselor then nudge that person to be like, hey, you said you wanted to work on this piece of social emotional health. Like, like let's get back in services, you know? So, um, so I, I think, but that can't happen. It cannot happen if we're not talking to each other, right? Um, it, if we're working in isolation, we just, we're just not working um, efficiently or effectively, right? And so how do, we, how do we do this one hour a month? Literally, it's an hour a month. I mean, how many things do we do for an hour a month? I mean, we, you know, you probably scrolled in your, scrolled in your Facebook for an hour a month, uh, an, an, hour, an hour at some point recently, right? And so um, we take an hour a month to really get, uh, get, get uh, on the same page with around our young people and their social, um, um, emotional, and kind of holistic needs. And, and we think it's well worth it. And maybe just add to, we are talking about just Jordan, but also... I think, John, didn't you guys do like a survey with all of the school kind of letting parents share what they're worried about most? And I think it, through that, it came up that a lot of parents were um, reporting that they don't really know how to help the kids that have a lot of anxiety. And so it's, it's this isn't about Jordan, but that, that came to the table. They contacted me and we were going to work together to do a presentation for parents on how to manage their children's anxiety. And it's for the entire school, not just the school, not just the kids who have Medi-Cal, but this is like a collaboration. We're there, they can talk to us. This is something that we can provide. Um, and they identified it as a need that this particular school had. <laughs> and so that's kind of mm -hmm. nice too, because I don't know how often that was being assessed until mm -hmm. um, John came on campus. Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. That's the whole idea, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you guys talked a lot about Jordan and the services that can be offered to Jordan. Um, but can you also talk about, um, in your entity, how else you can provide services to the rest of the family members? OK, so I think. So Jordan has two siblings, and what's really great about this, and Lada can talk to us about this, because she runs this, uh, it's a monthly school-based mental health consortium um, for PUSD, which is really great. I attend that as well, and all the other um, agencies in the community attend. And so those, we're not at every school, but some other agencies might be at Eric and Vanessa's school. Mm -hmm. And through this, I might be able to say like, oh, Vanessa goes to, I don't know, goes to a little, like that preschool, or Eric goes to a, another elementary school. We might be on that campus. We, meaning Sycamores, because we provide, we're on three campuses in PUSD, mm -hmm. which we could start just working and, and refer that little one. And, or, we could even work together what's best for the family, especially we don't want to have like eight providers going to one family. Yeah. Um, that's just a lot of work for them. And I, someone mentioned it earlier, like we get mad when they can't show up, but they have so many things to do, <laughs> so many yeah. people to talk to, and so many times that they have to tell their story. And so I think that it's, it's, it's helpful to identify like, okay, there, these are the other problems that are happening, and how can we provide services? So specifically for Sycamores, I would be thinking about um, Jordan's dad in regard to maybe we could refer to co-occurring 
because we have a co-occurring department in our agency, and if he's trying to stay sober and his sobriety affects Jordan, we could potentially provide him services to stay sober and really work with that. Um, also, if we could if we could get Eric and Vanessa's mom engaged in some type of service, yeah. it would really help Jordan because she might not be doing as much of the caretaking because their mom might be helping more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. What do you think? John? I can jump in. Oh yeah, great. Uh, John, you want to go next? <laughs> All right, um, so, so I'm representing the mental health services within the district. So my department, um, in partnership with Sycamores, namely with Shannon, with other mental health agencies that Shannon was um, alluding to earlier, um, along with um, John and other representatives from our school site administrators, other key personnel at school sites, we all got together pre-pandemic and we met over, I think, the course of a semester and we developed um, the mental health integration team's framework. So all of us were at the table um, brainstorming, we created a framework. And um, so my department is basically the liaison between the community agencies, the school site administrators. And so I've helped bring together this collaborative effort between you know, Sycamores, Waco, school site personnel, and in the form of a MEHA team. And so everyone's at the table creating this, this framework, and now the team is up and running at one of our at many of our school sites, but specifically the one that John and um, Shannon are at. And it's it's a well-oiled machine that's running so smoothly. And and so think of my team and my department as the liaison between all the services that um, are outside in the community, the mental health consortium, all those agencies that Shannon's alluding to, which are we have seven LA County contracted Department of Mental Health agencies that service our school sites, specifically students with um, Medi-Cal. And um, we meet monthly, we, we talk about barriers, we talk about successes on our campuses, we, we do a lot of referring to each other. So if something comes up in a hit meeting, say at Pasadena High School, where Shannon and, um, and John are at, and they need a referral to another agency, we can talk about that in our mental health consortium meetings. Mm -hmm. And then we can link these students to different services. Or, you know, just like I uh, mentioned earlier, Young and Healthy is another wonderful community partner that we brought on to the table, which is now they're part of the, the MAHIT meetings at um, one of our high schools that John and Shannon are at. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they're, it's a linkage between all the community resources. Not all of us have all the solutions. So we all bring in to the table and bring to the table um, different resources and, you know, and identifying what the school sites might need, what the, the, the children might need, the family might need. And so it's all at the table, it's been discussed. And Shannon mentioned earlier too, so our, these MHIP meetings are only currently at our middle and high school sites. And we're trying to expand so that they're at the elementary sites as well. So part of the Maxwell family, they're, they're, they're younger, they're at um, middle and elementary school sites. So if, there's any, if there are MHIP meetings and teams at these elementary school sites, we can, easily identify the younger siblings of needing support and then do warm handoffs once they graduate and promote from say fifth grade to sixth grade, so from elementary to middle, from middle to high school, these MHIP teams can help with these warm handoffs um, so that the next team can follow up with the family if, resource, if further resources are needed. Or maybe the MHIP team can say, hey, this is what we've been working on. We're handing this case to you and if you guys can start following up with the family. So. There's a lot of identification going on at these tables and our my department was just, you know, uh, it, it was bringing everybody to the table with everyone's support, creating, create, creating a framework that all of us agreed on. And then, so they're able to implement all these sites. Great, thank you. Maybe I can, maybe I can jump in real quick. Um, so, you know, there, there definitely there's a lot of mental health potential here at, within the Maxwell family and, and we're bringing a lot of those resources to bear. Um, you know, I think there's also a lot, a lot more kind of underneath the surface or, and I think someone has spelled out in the, in the, in the uh, narrative too. Um, like so many of our families currently and historically, especially families of color, just supporting with, um, you know, economic supports. Right. Um, so they, they're renting a, a home in the Central Valley, but it says that they're concerned with being evicted. It's really hard to like focus on school when you're concerned about being evicted. Right. And and then talking about credit card debt and those pieces. Right. And again, I go back like we are like the sixth biggest 
economy or seventh biggest economy in the, in the world, right? We have the resources to keep folks housed. And so how do we help um, families navigate those resources, right? But I even go back before that is like, how do we, how do we create the relational trust with a family like the Maxwells and with, uh, I think his name is Carlos Maxwell, um, to, to, to even engage in those conversations. So Carlos feels like I can, I can actually like let my guard down enough to like let you know what's going on in my house. And I'm not, I'm not worried that you're gonna call DCFS because we're poor, or I'm not worried that, you know, I, I'm, worried, I, I'm, I'm trusting that, you're, that you're, gonna, you're gonna help shepherd me towards the types of things that will create a, a more quality life for my family and lessen my stress and, and therefore keep me sober, more sober because I'm, I'm less stressed and those types of things, right? So just thinking about rental support, right? Um, utility support, food support, anything that you can bring to the table um, that, that keeps more money in folks' pockets, then they can use that to spend on gas, uh, six dollar gal a gallon gas right now, right? So, um, and, but but they're also thinking about the potential for county and state supports that are connected to the the elders and and the young folks too, right? Making sure everybody has Medi-Cal, making sure making sure that that the the elder um, you know is getting the types of subsidies that maybe she's that as a low income senior that she's that she's able to get, so she can also help her to provide for the family and take some stress off the off the dad and this youngster, right? So you know, but but part of that is first like letting letting the family tell their story and then the family lets you in, um, and that's slow work, right? That's not that's not um, especially for for communities of color and especially for for folks who maybe at schools they didn't have a great schooling experience, right? So how do we how do we really tactfully and in a savvy way engage families? in ways that feel trusting um, so that we can really help to get to the root. Um, Cause when we get to the root, we, we, we can start the, the help and the healing process, right? So mm -hmm. just wanted to add that piece. Great, thanks John. The last question, what additional infrastructure or partnerships would need to be in place to more, even more effectively serve the youth and the family? Um, and then, you know, after identifying how are you developing that and how can the district, county, and our state, what can the district, county, and our state do to support? So, Laura kind of touched on it a little bit because a lot of the schools, the schools within the district don't speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And so, that will lead to gaps in all kinds of services, um, whether it's mental health, whether it's, you know, academic help and sometimes there will a kid will go into PHS and they've had services before they're currently in services but the school has no idea because maybe that agency isn't talking to them and so then they would refer to us and we're like oh well they actually have services already so I think that it would if we could do something I think as a district because the warm hand up is happening sometimes mm -hmm. but if, if if we were able to I don't know like have some sort of like end of the year recap of like the kids like these are the ones that need some help and how can we make sure that that transitions to their next their next school year mm -hmm. or if they have to leave a school or something like that so this is something fairly new but I think you know in the consortium I think we do a really good job of speaking with each other but if there was a way that this was a little more official I think that would be super helpful mm -hmm. and I think also just kind of like what everyone's been saying about releases of information sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a that's a big one it's just a barrier and it yeah. makes it really hard sometimes yeah um and it, it's, it's slow it can be just slow to get the needs mm -hmm. met yeah and yeah. more paperwork and so much paperwork <laughs> all the paperwork <laughs> yeah. What do you guys think? Oh, you're on mute. Muted, muted, muted. After 7,000 Zoom meetings, still you're on mute. talking on <laughs> muted, man. Um, so I, I feel like I saw this question and I was really, it got me thinking, right? So um, the, the pandemic, like what a disaster this pandemic has been, right? I mean, holy smokes. But I think one of the, there's been some like maybe some, rays of hope that have come out of the pandemic, right? So I think about like the, at the federal level, I didn't say even what you asked, it's at state, county, and local, I think, but at the federal level, right? So the education secretary is Miguel Cardona and recently was just like talking about 
pledging, doubling down on school funding and funding and expansion of school-based mental health services, school-based and school-based health services. Amazing, right? Like how, how, how long have folks been kind of scrapping and fighting for, for change um, to really get those, the sycamores on site closest to kids, right? And so now federal bureaucrats are like, oh yeah, all right, this is a thing, okay, cool. So what, you know, we'll take it, right? Um, and then on the state level, so California, so, you know, Tony Thurman, Gavin Newsom um, are putting, are like moving $3 billion onto the table for community schools, right? So this idea that like, you know, folks like myself or, or and, and a whole bunch of other people can now be on school sites closer to young folks, coordinating services and bringing folks, bringing, bringing other people that care about kids and have resources and have skills to being closer, closer to young people and their families, right? To support the Jordans all over California. Right, California is full of Jordans, full of Maxwell families, right? And so how do, how do we, we properly fund the type of support that really supports those families and those students from a, from a ground level? Uh, and I'm really excited to be in Pasadena right now because Pasadena has applied for and received federal grants and state grants already. Um, you know, at one point I was the only community school in town, right? And now we have eight, eight community schools. And I've been training those community schools coordinators to really grow their practice as, they're, as they kind of step into this work. Um, and so to move, go from one into eight, and now we have $3 billion on the table, like we can have a lot of, a lot of this scaling up all over the state um, that, that is of, you know, that is really getting down in the weeds with families, building that relational trust, understanding the issues on the ground and supporting uh, families in the way that they need to be supported. So, uh, so I'm excited about, you know, kind of the federal, the state and the local pieces, um, specifically around this community schools work. I think it's really, really, really important. Great, thank you. Anything else? Yeah, we, we have time for questions. Presentations. We've talked in a number of different presentations about you know grassroots up is always incredibly valuable, but but leadership and from the top down is also invaluable. And I'm just wondering about you are talking about schools don't talk to each other, and there's gaps when kids make transfers and stuff like that. Isn't is the superintendent of schools behind this? Can, I mean, is there something the superintendent of schools could do to help um, create more seamless movement between schools and improve communication between schools? I'd say that's a good question for Lara. Yeah, Lara, did you hear Since that? Since you can give us the district perspective. So um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So someone was asking, because there's some gaps in, in the schools within the district speaking, is there something that the superintendent can do to try to ease that, um, those gaps? Absolutely, I'm sure, absolutely. It's, it's really getting everybody on board. And I, I feel like, especially during the pandemic, leadership on different, everybody has different leadership on their campuses. And there's no buy-in on some campuses around mental health and others. But I think at this point, everybody is realizing that yes, these, these services are highly needed. These teams are, are incredibly helpful. And so I think everybody's just more on board. Um, going back to funding too, having funding staff, having more funding to fund these staff, more sustainable funding. Grants are amazing. Even you know, my department's almost fully grant funded, but they sunset. And so how do we sustain, um, have more sustainable funding and then growing these but there has to be positions on campuses that can also implement these services. And so that there's leadership, but the leadership can always, they're not implementing. So they need to have other um, more sustainable uh, positions that are able to hold these meetings, do the linkages, provide the services. But um, yes, absolutely. I feel like, you know, there, there is a huge push towards more mental health services, more supports on our campuses. Our, our, our superintendents are absolutely pushing for that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the way I think, so Laura, Laura helps with this in regard to what we, as agencies, like what we could do, what the resources are in the whole entire district. Mm -hmm. And I think that having, 
Lara as our representative, we can we can get to the table and we can just have discussions about these things, or she can relay the information for us, um, because there are a lot of meetings. Um, but I think that for the most part, with this district, they value mental health, and we see that because they talk with us, they they communicate with us, and I think I think the Mahit meetings will make it a little bit like. It will be the, the actual practice of the communication. So this is a good idea to communicate, but the hit meetings are, that's how it's actually gonna happen. And so if we can implement them in all of the schools, not just our middle schools and our, and our um, high schools, it will just become a lot easier. Because then I will most like say, me, I'll be at all those. So I'll go from one school to another school to another school, and I'll be able, I'll help with that communication as well. Saying, oh, like there's, I know that there's this one kid, and I know that they're slated to go to PHS, and we're on that campus, so this is what we can do. And if there's another agency at the MHIT meeting, they would have the same thing. So I think it's, this is the hope, and then all of us have to do the work to do the communicating, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and I would say also in answer to the question, I definitely think Pasadena Unified supports mental health from the top down. Because we, in addition to um, the work that we're doing with Medi-Cal students, they're also funding edu educationally related mental health services on some of the campuses. So they are supporting that um, in some of the special ed classrooms. And um, they recently hired a, a fabulous assistant superintendent um, who was my son's kindergarten principal for a little bit. Um, so I know her and I know she's awesome. So I think they're, they're hiring the right people. They're bringing in, you know, they're kind of putting their money where their mouth is and, and adding, you know, um, uh, services to special ed classrooms, uh, you know, bringing community schools on campus. So I think there's a lot of good stuff happening in the district. Um, and I, I think John's right. I think the pandemic brought a lot of this to light. And I don't think it's just at Pasadena Unified. I think it's like, you know, across the country. Um, and so it's nice to kind of hear um, all the work that we're doing. And then I think the thing that happened too is that when community schools came in, in 2019, all it did was just bring more to the table about things we need to repair and fix and what the gaps are and what the communication gaps are and the funding gaps and the services and all that kind of stuff. So I think we have more, it, it brings more work to the table, but in, in a good way, because at the end of the day, you know, we've all talked about, it's the students and the families that are the ones that need to benefit and that need the services. And so I think the whole community schools model has really brought that like, you know, front and center to the campuses where that model exists. Yeah, question. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm a part of an organization that's kind of a last resort for prison families. Mm -hmm. A lot of the placements that we have right now are because it's because of COVID. You know, job loss, domestic violence, mm -hmm. uh, school attendance. Um, a lot of these pieces that you know culminate in you know placement with us. Um, the one thing that I see that's missing in a lot of these conversations is how are you building trust with families that are broken. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about, you know, working with the students and collaborative care and we're doing this and we're doing that. But how do you build trust with these families that are broken? They don't trust you guys. Mm -hmm. They don't. Mm -hmm. And I've been a family advocate for six years. Believe me, they don't trust. They don't the trust. System. Yeah, we know. So what are you doing to build trust with these families to mm -hmm. get them to buy into this work that you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. I think that's probably a good question for John, mm -hmm. since you're, you have the most direct contact with the families. Or are you specifically speaking to mental health, like like an actual therapist? Uh, trust. Just trust in general. Trust in general. All right. Yes. John, did you hear the question? I did. I, it's a great question. Great question. And it's 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 the hard. It's like the hardest part. It's like maybe the easiest and the hardest part of the work, right? I think when you're naturally somebody who can build a relationship and you're relational, I think it, it, it makes it easier. But yeah, it, it is super, it's it's super complex, right? Um, I think for me, sometimes I try to enter a conversation with a family around something like attendance, right? So it's 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 a it's like a kind of a neutral. It's like, hey, like your child's not coming to school as much as they possibly could. 
how could we help your child come to school more often? Right. And so it's not, it's not like, uh, I'm not, I'm not like putting it on you, mom. Hey mom, you, you know, you, you don't care about the kid or something. You know, I'm not, I'm not doing this, but we're, we're talking about data. Right. Um, and so I use that as an entry point. And then, the, you know, the parent might say something like, you know, this kid wants to sleep in and wants to, and will never, will never get up and, and go to school. And I'll say, well, you know, like, let's, you know, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit more about that. Right. And so, uh, and it might, that might end up with like, Hey, would you be willing for me? Maybe the three of us could get on the phone together. Um, and do a do a, a call and, and 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 I'll talk to the kid and we'll, we'll talk we'll, we'll kind of talk to the kid together right and and maybe that turns into a home visit um, you know and then that's where and that's where it's like oh wow oh okay the school's like one the school's calling me and is offering like to then get on the phone with me and my kid um, the school's like offering to come to my house um, like schools don't usually do that right and so how do you start to do things? Um, to let the, let the family know that you're willing to go the extra mile, right? Um, and you know, and 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 I think those I think those things pay off. I think those things pay off, especially when you do it from the school side, because again, um, that doesn't happen very often. And I think that parents see that, right? Parents, you know, parents of that have a kid who's older or have multiple kids have seen what schools are willing to do and what schools are not willing to do, right? And so if you can do things that's, that general schools are not willing to do and willing to push and willing to, you know, willing to, you know, hey, mom, this is my cell phone. Like, call me when you need to call me, right? Or you're, or you're texting, you're texting uh, mom and just checking in. Hey, you know, you came to school today and, and um, I appreciate that. I, I'll take a selfie with, a, with me and a kid. You know, uh, hey, he's on campus. I see him. He's on campus with me, and I'll text it to mom. And then, you know, those are the types of things I think that then when you have to have harder conversations, like, hey, your kid doesn't have enough credits and they're looking at alternative schools, like, then you can, you can, you can, you can get into those harder conversations or you can advocate. And, you know, parents might then be like, hey, we have an IEP meeting coming up. Like, can you send me the IEP? Right. And can you, can you, and then you, you know, you got to get in there and you got to, you got to go hard against the principal sometimes, right? But you, but 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 we understand that that's. That's that's one thing. A lot of people are like in Sacramento County. The uh, uh, an issue is they're threatening parents with arrest, you know, and putting mm. their child in juvenile hall because of attendance. I've been that parent, and I'm fortunate that I'm a strong advocate. But, you know, I, I'm like, I work overnight, so I'm dropping my kid off. It's my kid who's making this choice. But they're threatening me with jail. You know, you, you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. it just, it's, it's a deeper issue, you know, with parents in the school system. Because the school system, to a lot of parents, equates calling CPS. Right. I can, I can jump in real quick. So it's not my department, but I do want to let you know, at least at PUSD, we do have a whole attendance department, child welfare att uh, attendance department. Um, we have attendance advocates and attendance specialists. They work, we have interns who work with students who are chronically absent and truant, building that relationship, explaining the legal aspect of things. If you do miss school, this is potentially what could happen. Our, our goal is for it to not to get to the level of SARB hearings student attendance review board hearings. Our goal is to identify barriers, um, early intervention, prevent, prevention, early intervention, before you even get to that level. And there's a, lot, there's a whole department at the district dedicated to doing that type of work. And then SARB, me, I have not been to like, a, like SARB meetings from a long, long time ago, but all the SARB meetings that I've attended for the last two years, they're so, um, you think it's going to be a little bit combative and all the parents walk in ready. And I would too, as a parent. And I think that within five minutes, I think they understand that mm -hmm. everyone there is there to assist in solving a problem that is a struggle. And saying like, because half the time, sometimes a school doesn't know these things or it, it's never been shared that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't drop my kid off because of this, this, and this. And so I think that they, in those SARB meetings, which is like the end of the road at that point, if you're in a SARB, it's not great. And I think that they leave typically feeling like, okay, this person's gonna do this, this person's gonna do that, this is my job, and then this is my kid's job. And it feels, it feels not very punitive, which <laughs> I think sometimes, even me, sometimes there's some, I walk in there, I'm a little bit like nervous about some of the things that are gonna come up and sometimes parents are really not, no matter how nice or how 
lovely it seems, they still don't trust us or anybody. Um, but I think, like, I feel a difference in sometimes how the schools are looking at things. They are acknowledging mm -hmm. that there's so many things that a person has to deal with before they even show up for their first period. And I think it's leading to more care than it is, you know, like, discipline. Mm -hmm. or, or punishment. or Punishment, yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, oh, all right. I'm yeah, getting, I'm, gotta getting, wrap up. I'm getting the X name. We gotta wrap up. I didn't want to interrupt because it's a good conversation. Yeah. Great. So we if you have any questions, we have our contact information up here. We're gonna be here till tomorrow. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Jamie and the tech department for giving us a hybrid presentation today. Thank you so much. And, um, and then a shout out to our colleagues, Hillsides, who we partner with all the time at the consortiums with Laura. So yay for LA County. Thank you all very much.